Well, we have a season that starts today. And the Christians call it Advent. Amen? And uh, the first candle stands for hope. And uh, then you have love and joy and peace. Peace being the pink candle. Some denominations use four purple candles. Whatever you choose. But um, we chose this one this year. Hope. We're going to talk about hope. Amen. That's the title of the message. Hope. Which I think is up there, isn't it? Say blessed hope or something like that. The hope. Oh, amen. Hope. The title of the message is hope. And we're going to find out if you really know what hope is. The only other slide for this whole ser sermon is the next slide. And it's Jeremiah 33, 14 through 18, the NIV, and you can read along. This is pretty powerful. It says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. There's hope, isn't there? Verse 15, In those days and at that time I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. That's awesome. Verse 17, For this is what the Lord says, David will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of Israel, nor will the Levitical priest ever fail to have a man to stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, to pre present sacrifices. Hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born, this hope. There's hope. It's that time of year again for us to talk about it. Some of us, are, how many of y'all from up north? I know we got a lot of transplants down here. You got snow on the ground up north. Some of y'all, some some he's from New York. Some of y'all might be hoping for a white Christmas here. The younger you are, the more you hope for that. There's a lot to be said for us old, wise, gray-headed people. But some of you are dreaming of white Christmas. And there's, mu there's Christmas music on the radio already. There's Christmas decorations up. You know, the day after Thanksgiving, we put ours up. So you see our little tree out there and our little lights. And it's just happening. It's all around. The Christmas spirit has started. And each year, the church calls this season the Advent. It's our Christmas season. The word Advent comes from the Latin word adventurous, which means the coming of the Savior. And it should be an exciting time. It should be a time of hope and joy and love and peace. And we should meditate and ponder on what it really, really means to us personally. It is a holy season of the Christian church that marks a period of expectancy. Like a woman being pregnant. Really, really expecting Waiting for the preparation for the celebration of the nativity of Jesus Christ. Also known as the season of Christmas. The church has started to get decorated with some greenery here and there. And it seems like more happens each time the ladies get together. And by the time the 25th gets here there's stuff everywhere. And that green, evergreen, stands for eternity. It stands for Always having hope, love, peace, and joy. And the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The most common color used during this month, a lot of your major denominations, the pastor wears purple for the royalty of this month, for the, the coming of the Lord. The Advent candles represent a journey to Bethlehem. And today we start that journey with our first candle. Each journey starts on Sunday as we light these candles. And we get closer and closer to Bethlehem with each one of these candles. Today is the first Sunday in Advent. A Sunday by our first candle, the Hope Candle. As you'll see as it gets lit. We're going to read scripture from Luke. Chapter 2, verses 8, 8 sorry, through 15. 
There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Okay, this is the first Sunday in Advent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today, we light one purple candle. This is the candle of hope. Advent is a time of waiting and hoping. We will wait for the day when we celebrate again the birth of Jesus. We hope that everyone will come to know God and to worship God. You know, it's I used a purple candle. <laughs> purple light. Next is a scripture reading from Isaiah 60, verses 2 and 3. See the darkness comes, covers the earth, and, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and this glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. When we look at the first candle, we remember God's promises. God promised to send a Savior to the people. When we listen to our scripture reading, we hear what the prophet Isaiah wrote about God. God is the potter who made us. We know that the gospel... Read it, hold in the Bible. We know that the gospel witness is one that helps us understand that God is loving and just. God brings peace. This gives us hope. We anticipate again the birth of the baby Jesus, remembering that Jesus helps us know God's love for us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for the words of the prophet Isaiah that remind us that you are the source of our hope. Help us live each day, allowing you to form us in a way that brings about your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Amen. Amen indeed. Amen indeed. <clears throat> now with the lighting of the candle, we've begun our journey. Amen. Let's try to blow it out. Venturing forward with those shepherds that we uh, read about in the first scripture to the town of Bethlehem and the message this morning from those couple scriptures, the message of the candle being lit and what it stands for, the message that should be on our hearts and lips every season, beginning our journey. The message that we should be focused on today is hope. Great hope. But before we talk about this hope, I want to make sure you understand what hope really is. Do you really think you know what hope is? Because we use that word so often to mean so many things. Most of us that are over 50 woke up this morning and said, I hope I get out of bed without all my joints hurting. Well, the hands are going up. Amen. Some of us say, I hope it don't rain as we're riding our bikes to Waco this afternoon. You know, there's these hopes of everything. I hope for a white Christmas. I hope my wife gets me what I want for Christmas. And it's a lot of hopes in there somebody's probably thinking I hope Monty shuts up so I can see the football game on time amen I hope that so and so wins the football game but you see all of this is not the hope that this candle stands for today that's not the kind of hope that's represented by this candle today this lone candle that's standing here today on this Sunday the first Sunday of Advent is of a much greater and much grander hope 
And we need to separate those two today because it's so easy for us to get them together and say, well, I hope. And it's a much more higher hope. Greater hope. It represents the hope of an entire nation. No, actually it represents the hope of an entire world. That's a great hope, isn't it? Not just whatever you're hoping for. It represents something that you and I often take for granted. You know, we probably hear the Christmas story of this time of the year, once a year, every year. I don't know how many of you have watched Miracle on 34th Street already, but most, <laughs> yeah, us too. Glory to God, you know, um, or um, It's a Wonderful Life. They're not in here. By 25th, everybody will have watched both of those, most likely. 99% of you in here. I see the smiles and the nods. But we forget what it was like before the very first Christmas, which is the hope that we're supposed to be dwelling on, meditating on, pondering about during the Advent season. What it was like before the Savior came. I want you to imagine yourselves in the shoes of the shepherds that was read about first. And we just have one shepherd here. But the shepherd, uh, uh, in this case, the sandals that the shepherds wore. Put yourself in their shoes. If you have to close your eyes to try to uh, meditate on that or imagine that, if it makes it easier, go ahead. But they weren't living the kind of life that we live now. And I'm not talking about just everyday things. I'm talking about his religious life. It's much different than ours today. Church was much more about following strict laws. It was totally legalism. And they had to follow all these strict laws. And then coming into the sanctuary was for little more than just to make a sacrifice and to offer to pay for their atonement, get atonement for their sins. Pay the atonement for their sins so they could walk out and do it all over again because you could never ever live up to the expectations of the law. That was then. But they, they I mean it was an endless cycle trying to follow all these impossible rules to follow. Breaking the laws and then making payment for their sins through burnt offerings and sacrifices. All the time going to the priest. Knowing that when they left they wouldn't be able to stand up to that. You realize they would physically have to come back again and get the, their offerings to, to pay offerings to the priest at the temple. Never being good enough. Never being able to live up to the law. Always falling short. Now some of y'all can relate to this, huh? Always falling short. <coughs> can you imagine how tired? How defeated? How desperate one would begin to feel coming up short every time they turned around? All the time? Forever and ever having to pay your way into heaven? Quote, unquote. I mean, some people believe that today, but they're caught up in the if the spirit of illegal of, of legalism. It should be illegalism. <laughs> anyway, they're caught up into it. Never finding enough to pay make the payment in full. Because we can't. We can't. That would be frustrating, wouldn't it? But there was hope. There was four hundred years of hope. Well, there was over four hundred, but there was four hundred years where there really needed hope because there was nothing really going on. There was darkness. You look again at thirty three 14 through 16 is still up there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And Jeremiah wrote to his people about the great hope they had. And you see that in the first, first verse there. The great hope that's on its way. See, they would not have to make atonement forever and ever anymore. Soon there would come the Lord who would never lack. Not a high priest that needs to receive anything, but you just saying you're sorry. You just confessing your sins to Him. You didn't have to go scrounge up the money and get the offerings and come back to put them away and then go back someday and fall short again. To summarize it up, the prophet Jeremiah says, the throne will never be empty. Amen? And he says, the debt will forever be paid. Forever your debt is paid. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty exciting. There was hope for these people before the first Christmas. And this is a hope that the shepherd had in his heart that night. When it said they were scared to death. That's Monty's commentary. They were scared to death. You know what I'm saying? They were frightened. I can only imagine. And you think God don't have a sense of humor? This one angel scared them almost to death. Then the host of angels. 
Y'all didn't get that. Nobody. You should all been laughing. If you just imagine that, come on. All these shepherds are finally coming through going, oh, I almost had a heart attack and they're helping each other up and they're still wobbling around. And some man, that was, whew, I guess we need to be going. And all of a sudden, boom! The host of angels everywhere. God's got a sense of humor. Come on, folks. The Savior has been born. And the shepherds are excited. There's no more He is coming. There's no more He will be here. It was He is here. Isn't that exciting? Try to put yourself in their shoes. Can you imagine that much excitement? Can you imagine that much hope? Or can you imagine that much anticipation? I mean, I don't know what we've ever waited for in our lives and all of us have had to wait and wait and we're really excited and we're hoping for something but nothing compares to this. The eagerness to run to Bethlehem to see the Lord. The Bible study Wednesday, that movie was great. But I still, I see four, I see four shepherds running as fast as they can, falling over, getting up again, and still running. And I don't see any shepherd stopping to help the other one up because he was too excited to see the baby Jesus. They said, you're young, you own. And they're just running. <laughs> getting to Bethlehem, amen? They showed him walking. I don't, that's just, just, it said they were excited, you know. They really wanted to see baby Jesus. So, uh, and, you know, you can get as excited as you want and you can visualize what you want. And if you think it was a bunch of four, four old shepherds taking their time with walkers, that's fine. Me, my guys were running. There was a tail behind them from their little robe. They were holding it up like this so they didn't trip. <laughs> see, you're getting a visual. Come on, people. <laughs> the shepherds were excited. He's coming. He's here. Amen. Our shepherd was overflowing with hope and joy. And then, to be told that it's happened. There's a story that I want to share that uh, will help you understand, I think. And some of y'all have probably heard the story. Um, I just can't emphasize enough about what you're hoping for and what it stands for. I mean, the birth of Jesus Christ was your king coming here. Amen? That your sins can be washed away as white as snow. Forevermore, the throne. Something's on the, some, a king is on the throne forevermore. The son of the Most High. And the story goes like this. Some of y'all probably have read this story. There's, a, there's an elderly man and his son, he's a widower, and, in, and uh, he collected artwork. Lots and lots of art. And you pick out the most renowned artist that you want. Picasso, Monet, whoever. Van Gogh. Somebody said. Rembrandt. You pick it out, picture that, and it's these... This guy had millions of dollars worth of artwork in his, in his home. And you men can relate to this. You like it when your son picks up after you something that you trade or whatever. Well, his son became a collector and he was really good at it. Getting them at the good price. And next thing you know, this house is full of millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of perfect, awesome pictures paintings and people around the world all over the world began to know who this man was and his son they collected them together and then this this man his son his son uh, went off to war because the nation found themselves in a war and the young man wanted to serve his country and so he went off to war and he wasn't in the war hardly a month or two. And the old man received the telegram that nobody wants to receive. And that was that his son had died in the war carrying another man to a medic. That was not a really good Christmas for him that year. And the following spring there was a knock at the door. There was a young man at the door and he says, I was your son's friend and I, I wanted, I'd like to 
visit with you a few minutes. I have something for you. And the old man said, so you knew my son? He says, yes, sir. I'm the man he was carrying when he died. So the old man brought him in. And they talked for a few minutes. And he said, I have this for you. And it's a big covered gift. And as he took the paper off, it was a painting that that young man had made of his son. And the collector looked at it and it had a striking resemblance of his son. But he obviously knew it wasn't true art because he's, he's a collector. He had one prominent place in the house where he kept the painting of all time. It's like it was an idol. It was, you know, that thing that you want everybody to know you own. And it was above the fireplace. And with a tear in his eye, thanking the, this young man, he took that painting down and he put the painting of his son above the fireplace. The painting that wasn't worth anything monetarily, but meant a lot to him. After about another year, this man passed away. The whole world's anticipating this. Now there's a whole bunch of hope for this whole world because now there's millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of paintings fixing to be sold. People come from all over the world. Thousands of miles they fly in to attend this auction. The final day has come. The auction starts. The auctioneer gets up and he pulls the shroud off of the first piece of artwork and it's the picture from above the fireplace. It's the picture of the sun. Nobody wants to bid on that. It's not even a piece of art as far as they're concerned. And the auctioneer says, I need a bid. And nobody wants to bid. And one man with a real callous voice in the back said, we don't care about that. Move it out of the way. Get the real artwork up there. We want to auction on the real stuff. Hmm. The auctioneer said, somebody has to take the sun. This is the first piece that has to be auctioned off. That's the will that was written by this man. Another guy said, we don't want the sun. And the rest of the people started grumbling. We don't, we don't want that. He says, this is the final offer. Somebody has to bid on this. And a guy in the back said, look, I, I, I knew him and that certainly does look like him. I, I'll, I'll bid the $100. Just $100. Wanted another bid. Nobody made the bid. It's silent. Finally, he says, going once, going twice. Sold for $100. Uproar. All right, let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. And he said, no, no. The auction's over. And these people that travel from all over the world are livid. They're, they're like, what do you mean? And the guy that was so callous in the back of travel, the furthest, had the most money, expected to go home with the most stuff, stood up and said, what are you talking about? He said, that's the way it was written up in the will. Whoever will take the sun gets it all. You see, so many of us miss the gift of Christmas. So wrapped up in the things of this world. All the things that we're doing right now to get ready. All the stuff that we're doing for family. We're wrapped up into the prizes of this world. The masterpieces of this world. When all we should be focused on is the sun. <coughs> this, is, this is how Christmas should be for us. Focused on just the sun. The hope of His coming. All of the hope of the coming Messiah hinges on the true purpose of His coming. And that is that He paid His all. For you and me. He paid all our debts. Amen? Amen? Freedom from sin and death. So as we begin our journey to Bethlehem, let us remember this hope as one who does not take a gift for granted. As so many do. Let us remember that it was like, or what it was like, before Jesus came and was born. Try to picture that. Try to picture what it was like when Jesus came before Jesus came into our personal lives, we were all slaves to sin. There ain't nobody in here that wasn't. 
until we give our life to the Lord. Until He came into our lives. Let us look to the babe in the manger through the eyes of that shepherd gazing on his Lord for the first time. Amen? Fully understanding. Fully understanding what a large fulfillment, huge fulfillment that this baby in the manger had made for you and me. What he represented. Let us look forward to December 25th with that same hope in our hearts. Knowing the price that He has paid for you and me. Let us know the true meaning of the angel's words when the angel declared, Behold, I give you good news of a great joy which will come to all the people for to you is born this day in the day of, in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Dwell on that. It is our Christ. It's our Savior. It's our Lord who awaits us in Bethlehem. Amen? Amen. It is to Him that we will journey these coming weeks as we go through the Advent, getting closer and closer to Bethlehem, closer and closer to the 25th of December. May your hearts be filled with the great hope of expectation as we journey forward. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you again for a short message. I thank you for the hope. Lord, I pray that we dwell on your Scriptures today and we dwell on the story that you've given us. The true hope of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray everyone in here knows your Son and has an intimate relationship. Lord, I pray that you stir up the hearts of those that don't. If there's any here, Lord, bring them into your fold. That's what the hope, the hope is for. Eternal life with you. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.